Hey, welcome back to the show. I'm about to make you feel old. No, don't do that. I'm going to do it. 20 years ago today, November 16th, the cute kid with the lightning scar on his forehead showed up on the movie screen, waving his wand and casting spells with his friends. Wow, yeah, 20 years. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was the first of eight movies full of magic and suspense, wizards we loved, and those we didn't. Don't say his name. I will not. The film's movie director, Chris Columbus, takes us back. I can't believe we're 20 years in since the first time that we saw Hogwarts revealed on the big screen. And, you know, that's a scene that still gives me the chills, seeing the train come around and seeing Hogwarts for the first time. I mean, obviously you were making a major motion picture. You knew that. But did you have any idea how it would weave itself so deeply into pop culture? Uh, no, because it was fuel. <laughs> it was legitimately fueled by fear. We were designing the entire world. Not, none of this existed except on the page. So I had to have a meeting with Joe Rowling and basically explain my vision for the film. It took about two and a half hours. And I was in that moment of terror because when I first got the job, I had 20 seconds of euphoria and then nothing but terror and anxiety <laughs> and second guessing myself. And this finally with Joe, I finished and she said, that's, that's exactly the same way I see the movie. So that was a vote of confidence that really enabled me to dive deep into this world. And, you know, I had a lot of wonderful collaborators in terms of production designers mm -hmm. and people who, Stuart Craig, the production designer, they saw the same world that Joe Rowling, myself, saw. And, you know, we were able to put it together and build it so it, w it lasted for eight movies. What was your favorite scene to direct? If you can parse it down, maybe one or two. I think my favorite scene to direct was the chess sequence. I mean, we built all the, most of the sets, but that set, all of the pieces were built and they were life-size, bigger than life-size. So when the kids walked onto that set, the they were dealing with tangible things. And they, Rupert was actually sitting on the horse. Things were exploding. And their performances in that scene, I think are my favorite in the movie because they weren't reacting to a green tennis ball on a stick. No. They were reacting to something that was really going on. What about the characters? Did you know that when you were casting Harry, Hermione, did you know that they were all gonna have this great chemistry and friendship for years to come? No, I mean, I knew that we were casting kids who did not have a lot of experience because I didn't, I wanted kids like we did with Macaulay Culkin mm -hmm. who had limited experience, but then could bring this naturalistic, realistic quality to the screen. And you yeah. get surprises in that. It's a lot of work, you know, because sometimes their concentration wavers and they're not really professionals. But I didn't want a professional Nickelodeon team of kids mm -hmm. who've been working for 13 years who just are gonna use their own bag of tricks. I wanted something that felt real. No one can know, even with, with my own kids, I don't know how, I didn't know how they were gonna age, what they were gonna look like 10 years from the time right. when they were adorable, cute kids. We were very fortunate. Not only did they age gracefully and beautifully, but they're, they got to be better actors as, from movie to movie. Oh, by the end, I mean, it was just ripping out my heart. Um, oh, yeah. And I was, you know, I was not a kid. This was kind of past my childhood, but I was young adult when the films came out. And I fell in love with them. I mean, what is it that speaks to both children and adults about these films in this franchise? Uh, well, we never, you know, the, the interesting thing is I, I never got into when I was making a perceived family film like Home Alone or mm -hmm. even Mrs. Doubtfire, we always wanted to make the film for the parents as well. I wanted to make, you know, I wasn't making a film for kids. I was making a film for audiences. Mm -hmm. So by not talking down to kids and doing, you know, having lighting that's too bright or acting that's right. too over the top, really presenting a well-made film with great performances by great British actors that sort of respect transcends through the screen and the kids, the kids themselves and the parents realize, oh, oh, some parents would probably walk away, but a lot of parents would say, eh, you know, I'm gonna watch this. So it's important for me that the film works for everybody. But we're all grateful for that parents. Like, what do you hope is the legacy going forward in years to come? I just hope it continues. I mean, that was the mantra for the crew when we started, we st quite frankly, it started on Home Alone, but with Harry Potter, I said, we have to make a film that's timeless. I want this film, ironically, I probably said back then, 20 years from now, I'd like when people are watching this film on TV for it to feel as fresh as if it were made yesterday. And that's what everybody went into. And if you look at the film now, particularly the Hogwarts sequences, you don't know 
That the film could have been made in 1939. It could have been made in 1956, yeah. 2020. You don't know, and that to me, hopefully, will continue to maintain its longevity. Wow, isn't that awesome? Yeah. I love that series, actually, of movies, yeah. It's amazing. More than 700 Christmas dinners were prepared per day for a two-week period while those scenes were shot. That's amazing. And, and it's amazing to think that it's been 20 years since the first movie. Can't believe that. It's unreal. It makes us feel. Well, the food in the Great Hall always looked great, especially the desserts. Oh.